didn't know it was going to yell at me. Yep. Um, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Zoom. The, I've gotten so used to Riverside. Like, I'm just sitting here wondering in the background if I have audio <laughs> actually recording, or is this just going to be one of those that I give up to the gods? <laughs> we should. Can I record well, it to be safe on this side? It's, it's gonna not going to matter because we've got her too, unless you want to hear a conversation between you and I without a third person. That could be funny. It could be like, um, dude, what are they called? Mad Libs, where you just insert what you think the third party said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You could have some fun with that. <laughs> Might be funny. I have, a, I have well, a million questions about Falcons, though, that you're not going to be able to answer. Exactly. <laughs> We actually do have a third person today, Dr. Margaret. My name is Jay. Welcome to the Tragic Academy, a show created to bridge societal divides in a judgment-free zone using candor and humor. Gary, what's going on, my man? How you doing? Living the dream. We're both repping into the AM today. I just noticed that. Oh, yeah. Um, we both have on their basic tees, which are super comfortable. Um, yes. So please go to our website and purchase into the AM. <laughs> it's on the sponsors and merch. Makes tab. you look like you have muscles. <laughs> Makes you feel like you have muscles. They do yep. fit right. They have like some, uh, I don't know, alien technology around the gut area. <laughs> yeah. I can't breathe, but it looks really good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Margaret, for joining us. Dr. Margaret is a master life coach, professional certified coach, and NLP master. Definitely want to ask about that today. Certified mindfulness practitioner veterinarian and speaker and an award-winning author and something really cool the executive director of abu dhabi falcon hospital how you doing today dr margaret wonderful thank you so much for having me it's an honor it's an honor to have you <laughs> i'm looking forward to <laughs> i think it will be a really great show <laughs> absolutely absolutely and, you know we were looking at all of your stuff earlier and we couldn't stop sending each other links back and forth because you've just got so many cool things going on different articles and i want to i do want to ask though the nlp stuck out to me because we have a friend of the show ryan montis do you know him i don't know him personally no <laughs> okay but you're familiar with him is that the same <laughs> program <laughs> it's, it's pretty similar actually yeah nlp is super cool and a lot of people have some prejudices uh, regarding nlp um but I think it's something extremely helpful, something that people can really use. And I think people need to be a bit more aware of what it really means. Do you want to tell us what it is? Yes, I'm happy to do so, because a lot of people think NLP, it's like a kind of brainwash, you know, like a kind of you get some ideas planted in your brain and then you have to do it. But it's something completely different, actually. And I think the idea of NLP is actually that you really go back to those self-limiting beliefs that you really go to those things which you cannot really, yeah, sometimes which are even in your subconscious mind. And it is important that you visit those things and then you can change them through certain techniques that NLP teaches you that a coach can help you with. For example, you can change perspectives. Let's say you are in a difficult situation and you're so much absorbed in this situation that you don't see a way out anymore because it's just too much for you. So for mm. example, NLP helps you to change the perspective, to detach from the situation, to dissociate a little bit, to become a bit more neutral, and then to look at the situation from the outside, for example. Right. So, sorry, I just want to ask a question slash See if I get an understanding, because when I talked to Ryan Montes about this, one of the things that was uh, super interesting to me is that it utilizes a mindfulness and meditation practice to access that particular part of the mind and show you that these particular feelings that we get from childhood or experiences are actually veils that are created out of fear that you could actually move through, but you're yes. stifled in your everyday life living in that emotional cyclone without realizing that you can actually just step out of it and move on to something different. Exactly. I wouldn't even call it veils. I would call it even layers that sometimes mm. are so tough, one layer above the other one, that it's hard for you to access the one mm. which is most underneath. And you need to remove layer by layer to reach to that place. And uh, that is very important because this is like, as you said correctly, it can be caused by fear. It can be caused by trauma. 
It can even be caused by a kind of misunderstanding in your childhood. And once you are able to start accessing those certain experiences or fear or trauma, then slowly, 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 you can start to overcome them because you can start processing them because you start to become aware of them. And that is essential because this is key. Once you are not able to reach there and to start processing, you cannot overcome it. And NLP can greatly, greatly help you in this as well as inner dynamics. I love that you said something in particular in that and that it was a misunderstanding in childhood. People forget that it's not necessarily an outside catalyst that can cause this kind of viewpoint that you have on your reality. It can be the simple misunderstanding of a facial expression as to how somebody might feel about you in the last moment you saw them to create some kind of bizarre reality that you have tied to that person where they actually, in your mind, believe you are a kind of person. You create a personality in somebody else's eyes. It can be. Based on your own interpretation. Yes, it can be this because you have to think that a child looks at the world in a different way. The whole world revolves around the child. I mean, we as an adult look at it from a different point of view. But as a child, you are the center of the world. You project each single thing on you, on yourself. Mm. You you don't understand that sometimes things are different. And for example, I had one client and... <laughs> She had a conversation with her mother when she was only four years old and her mother was suffering from cancer. So her mother told her that she has cancer. Now, the little girl understood that she herself has cancer. So it was a total misunderstanding Whoa. because she put everything around herself because she's a child. You know, she cannot make this differentiation. So all her life, she actually thought that she has cancer. So she went from doctor to doctor. She couldn't sleep at night. She woke up because she was sure she has cancer. And then I did inner dynamic sessions with her and we did also NLP, but mainly inner dynamics. So we came back to the subconscious mind, to the conversation that happened when she was the young girl. And then we found out that it was actually this conversation that was misunderstood. She misunderstood it. And once she understood the point that it was her mother's illness, not her own cancer, she was totally relieved. I sent her to a doctor to get a full checkup to be sure that everything is fine. She was 100% okay. And then what she told me after was, you know, it's the first night I can really sleep without having fear that I'm suffering from cancer. And it's a relief. And I suffered from this 44 years. So just oh, think wow. about this huge freedom. impact it had. Yes, the freedom. Wow. Uh, and this new life that she could create. Because she knew now it was just a misunderstanding in the conversation. So it, it is amazing what you can do with these kind of tools. It is amazing. Gary, you had a question it looked like. Yeah, I was just processing it. I'm 43, so I couldn't imagine like thinking that way my whole life. And then all of a sudden, like I was wrong based on one thing mm -hmm. when I was four. It's kind of like I had a friend that we were friends on Instagram. We texted for a long time and we had a little bit of an argument recently. It was just off the tone of a text that was... She thought I meant it in a certain way that I, I totally didn't. You know, we finally talked about it yesterday in, I was, you know, actually on the phone and I just explained what I meant. She's like, oh, I'm so stupid. Like I totally just thought it was something else. And, you know, I had this other person do something that it was similar to what I thought that you did. And then it was completely, you know, misunderstanding. But she's over there probably thinking this guy's a jerk and like he doesn't take me seriously and all this stuff. And I'm like, it's not even what I was talking about, like totally different topic. You know, yes. so I think yes. it's kind of the same thing. You will layer experiences on that too. You'll have mock misunderstandings with that person trialing yes. it over and over to get a different outcome yes. until you drive yourself batshit crazy. And the next time you see them, you actually have anxiety for something that never existed in the now. Yes, exactly. So weird. <laughs> we have a mental illness just being alive. <laughs> Yeah, and that's true. The point that you mentioned is so important that just a simple misunderstanding, even in the tone of voice, which you don't mean, but the other person understands it in the wrong way, can really create such a misunderstanding that it really starts festering in your mind. It starts blocking your mind. It is changing your mindset and it is changing the way how you deal with that person. And from a real great friendship, something really disastrous can come out. And that's where we really need to think to step back and also to, yeah, and that's what we are doing in NLP, actually, to dissociate ourselves from the situation and to look at it from a neutral point of view. When we look at it from a neutral point of view and we try to put ourselves in the position of the other person, 
then we will see that, oh, it's not like this. It's not like how we thought. And then you can really see what's the reality. But a lot of people don't know how to do that. It's tough. Yeah, it's like letting somebody have a key to your meditation room inside your head that Mm -hmm. you're allowing them in while you're meditating with the ability to identify those particular areas and talk to you while it's happening. Super weird, but makes complete sense when you think about the way that the mind works. And I think I described it last week as a cyclone and it's literally meditation is sitting in the center of it and watching like the cow, the house, the truck or whatever. And I expanded upon it the other day when I was thinking about it. And I imagine that the inside of that is like a snow globe where you're sitting Mm. inside that snow globe, but that snow globe, you can actually reach through it. You can reach through it, grab things and bring it back in. So you can grab the cow, but the cow might be a experience or a thought about something. And when you pull it inside, suddenly it is now your reality. If you don't grab it, it's not. But the moment you get that life and pull it in, it's now your reality until you let it go and you pick the next thing in that cyclone to grab onto. I honestly believe that we all have one cyclone and we're just picking thoughts, but that's a whole nother fucking bucket. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about at all. I lost you at like the snow globe part. Did, I was like, did you catch I me, a- Dr. Margaret? <laughs> I love the snow globe. <laughs> it's a great picture. <laughs> I mean, snow globes are cool, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was I was kind of with you, and then now I'm like picturing it's, something. It's a protected maybe. area inside the yeah. cyclone. Right. That's all. <laughs> he he God. confuses me often. I love it though. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I continue. Halfway through, I was like, "Oh, I finally got one of these analogies," and I'm like, "Nope, no, nope, I have no idea what he's talking about." I added the snow globe to it <laughs> yeah, and effed like, them all up. No, I, I kind of <laughs> get it. I definitely, I definitely get it. I'll, I'll have to study the whole topic more to. It has a little more context. I think it's it's hard to like take yourself out of it when you're emotionally attached to something too. It's like when you're in a bad relationship and all your friends tell you it sucks and your girlfriend's terrible and, and all this and you're in it too deep and you don't feel that way. But everyone objectively is seeing things going wrong and you're so emotionally attached that you can't step back and be like, wow, that's just going wrong. But that's exactly the point where mental health coaching and NLP yep. can help you. Because right. as you say, you're so much emotionally attached to the other person that you are not able to look at the whole situation from a neutral point of view. And once you do mental health coaching, you set up your mind in a correct way again. You get out of this very tight emotional uh, attachment. You get out of it and you look at this situation from outside. And once you are able to do that and you dissociate, then you are able to to judge on it in a better way. You see what's really happening, but you cannot see this while you are in the very situation. If Mm. you have this emotional attachment, you are not able to see reality. You see what you think you see in this emotional attachment, but Mm. you're not seeing the really reality to say it like that. And once you are able to look at it from outside, you change the perspective, then you will understand why your friends say it's a toxic relationship because you see that the way how, let's say, your partner deals with you, it's not in the correct way. It's not in the way how it should be to support each other when you love each other. So it really helps to look at things from a different point of view. And it helps to really clear your mind. Because if your mind is too much involved in all of this, you are not able to see how things are in reality. Yeah, that makes sense. You can't trust yourself. Your mind yes. over-rationalizes yes. anything. You need that third party in there. Exactly. And what we don't even realize is our entanglement is so deep yes. that we actually have an addiction to the feeling of the fear associated with that particular situation. So much so that we will heighten it to a point where we think that the anxiety attack is something we don't want, but we're actually living in it because that's all we know how to do. Exactly. And it's also something that support to protect you. I mean, for example, in inner dynamics, we are talking about the parts that we have in ourselves. You know, sometimes we say, oh, a part of me would like to go to the movies and another part of me would like to sit on the couch just to watch a TV show. So these are parts that are talking to us. And in situations like you mentioned, there might be a part that tries to protect you from, yeah, from being hurt, from being hurt from the partner. 
But inside, and that's a protector part, but inside you have this vulnerable part, this part that's very close to really you that has been hurt before, but doesn't want to be hurt again. And it's stuck there. So the patterns of behavior is changing, but you try to protect yourself from pain, from hurt, from this kind of of feeling also of loneliness, because what happens if this relationship breaks down? You have to start mm. new. You have to create a new life for yourself and, and you are so much attached to the partner. Yeah. Also, it might be toxic. But this is what we do in inner dynamics. We try to remove this protector part to let it understand that you had been hurt and to, yeah, to remove this burden that is so deep in your subconscious mind that you even don't know that it exists, that it is there. And once you start to realize it is there and you start to access it, then you can start to heal it. And once you start mm. healing it, the pain will go. And that's when my clients say, you know, it's like a burden is falling from my heart because mm. that's what it is. Literally, it is a burden that comes off. And once this comes off, those protector parts, they start to relax because now they know that the pain is gone, the hurt is gone, this burden is gone. So they can just help you to create a new life. And that is so essential to live happily. It's like the Wizard of Oz. Once you get a chance to peek behind the curtain, you see what it's actually being created out of. It becomes yes. complete and total nonsense. It has to be so liberating as you peel back those layers yes. and you get to breathe. I yes. mean, essentially, to me, my anxiety represents itself as like an anvil on my chest. And as I meditated over the last three years, it slowly becomes less and less of a weight or it becomes something that I just understand is there, but doesn't actually have the ability to kill me. It has no ability. It's just there. And I'm only feeling it because of the emotional attachment that I have to whatever the situation is. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. Yes. And I think when you get to lighten that load on somebody and they get a chance to take that deep breath, and realize that they've been afraid of the boogeyman for so long. It's literally that. That's what's so sad yes. about all of it. Yes, exactly. And that's so liberating, actually, because in the end, once you are able to remove this fear and those burdens, you are coming back to your real self, your core self, your inner self. And this is creating this, this state of, of peace, of serenity, of calmness. And once you feel this state, then you are able to understand how to go back to it. And that's exactly what you said. This is, this is the state where, yeah, nothing can harm you anymore because things become very clear, become very peaceful, very calm. And meditation helps a lot with this because your mind stops going round and round and round because we are like, our mind is like in a merry-go-round. It never stops. We go from thought to thought to thought and it's never ending. And a lot of those thoughts are, not required because we have worries for things that will never ever happen in <laughs> so our life. not required. <laughs> <laughs> and we just move on. But we are not focusing just on the present, on the very now. And that is so important. And that's where mindfulness and, and meditation greatly, greatly helps. And I do a meditation, a free meditation session uh, for people. And, and once I do this meditation with them, after this, they say, oh my God, you know, we did one meditation. The guy said, you know, it's the first time in 34 years that I can hear my heart beating because mm. in the meditation, he slowed down so much that he was able to listen to his heartbeat and to himself. And this shows how much we are already out of, of a natural state of being. And that's why it's so important to create this state of peace, of kindness, of serenity. And that's where, yeah, inner dynamics and meditation and mindfulness greatly helps us. Being able to monitor your autonomic system and using your breath as a metronome yeah. and not having to actually attach it to yourself is something that comes with time, but you can't mess it up if you continue to do it. It's bizarre. To me, I'm not a religious person. I am, though, of the belief that most people are right kind of thing, that it's kind of a collective understanding. But faith for me was always something hard for me to get my head to wrap around. And the only time in life that I've ever been able to do that is meditation. And here's how it was. It was the moment that I didn't breathe for myself. I know that sounds weird, but if I tell you to breathe, you will take over. We're so arrogant in our mental illness that we actually believe we can catch our breath. 
No, it does it on its own. You can stick a bag over your mouth or whatever, but I promise you, you're going to gasp. It's going <laughs> to happen. Yes. But we take it over. But in meditation, there's a moment where you say, okay, this one's not going to come from me. And you step off a cliff and you feel it pull itself back up. And it's hard at first to allow it to continue to do that. But yes. after a little while of, you know, repeating this exercise, eventually you have faith in the fact that you will breathe while yes. you're focusing on it without doing it yourself. Yes. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody else, but that was the only way that I could rationalize it. Gary, I'm seeing. Are you in a snow globe while you're doing this? <laughs> <laughs> See, but I describe the look that you have on myself all the time as a pig staring at a wristwatch, like just confundled. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> I thought I had it again, and then I was like, now we're jumping off cliffs. And I, are we back in the cyclone? Or not? So, but no, Dr. Got, Market, I'm just, I'm just giving you crap. I, I, I got it for sure. <laughs> I, know. I love it though. This is what this is who we are. <laughs> like. <laughs> I mean, it hurt my brain to get there, but I'm there now. <laughs> <laughs> my merry-go-round is going like so that, fast right now. That's it's like, an oh. ad. <laughs> that's a soundbite for the show. Just have you sit there and say that. Tune in and have you just lay off that entire line. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I got it. No, no. It's like working overtime. It's like, you know, got something wrong with your engine and it's really got a crank to turn over. But then once you get going, like, then just run fine. That's, yeah, that's what happened there. Love it. That's kind of like uh, push starting a stick. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Stick shift car, yeah. yeah stick shift car. So, well, then let's, uh, let's lighten this a little bit. Step away from maybe the mental health for a moment because I need to know about falconry. That is so damn cool. You're a veterinarian and you are a proponent for uh, healing through animals. Yes, exactly. Um, falcons are very, very unique. I was actually the first female veterinarian, the first female falcon doctor here in, in the Middle East, in, in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. And when I came here 20 years ago, oh my God, you know, the, the falconers were not even used to have a hospital there. I mean, it wow. was uh, still um, very much in the beginning. And when I came over, they thought a woman is never able to do that job. I mean, of course, it was a male-dominated world. Just all the falconers were men. And what's the beauty of it? Most of the falcons are female because the female falcon is the large one. They are one third larger than the male. So all huge, big, beautiful falcons, of course, are female. Means also they are more expensive than the males. This mm. is like in real life, you know. <laughs> the yes. ladies are always more expensive. So the men know it's, that. <laughs> it's the fancier car. It's the yeah. one with the turbo. It's of the course. leather seats. It's, <laughs> yes. it's one step up. I, I get it. I'm I'm with you. Exactly. So when I came here, it was really, really difficult. You know, in the beginning, the falconers refused to let me touch their falcons because they thought, oh my God, she's a woman. She has no clue what she's doing. No, no, no. She can harm our falcons. So they brought the falcon of their cousin just for a fecal examination. So you didn't even have to touch this falcon. You just took the droppings, you checked it in the microscope, but they came just to see me. They so brought the you a side could... falcon? They brought you like a knockoff falcon? Yeah, was it like, <laughs> they had like one wing? <laughs> There's a pigeon. It's like, here's, <laughs> <You're> a, pigeon. <laughs> here's a pigeon. Like, 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 that, that's a pigeon. I know something about that. Yeah, it was really tough in the beginning. <laughs> I love that you stuck with it, though. Yeah. You stuck with it and said, okay, give me your ugly pigeon. I'm going to give it a full examination. <laughs> now give me the falcon. I said they didn't want to do it, but then they had emergencies. So they didn't have another ah. option. So they had to bring the falcon to me. And you know, they were half dying themselves to bring this falcon to me. But then they saw that the falcons are surviving. And this actually mm. started to make the change, but this took around one to two years. It didn't go oh, in a geez. month. It was a long, long, long so time. So you didn't do it for them. <laughs> no. You didn't do it for them. You did it for the animals. Exactly. I did it yeah, for the you, animals. You have because to. There's I wanted no to way. Save the falcons. I love the falcons. You know, and they are just when you look in their little black eyes, it's like magic. You know, you just it's like a virus that's catching you and that never lets you go. So they are really, really amazing. Such magnificent animals. I'm super enamored with it because I had um, yeah. I had a lot of experiences here on uh, where I live with red tail hawks. 
They oh are goodness. everywhere here. Mm. I've got some that follow me, that scream. Amazing. They're always around. And I've it's been something that has been on my mind for years. And when I watch these falconry videos, uh. so what does a falcon injury look like? Because they're hunting. That's what they use these for, essentially, yes, right? Exactly. Because here in the Middle East, falcons have always been used for hunting, never as a sport, but as a necessity to hunt meat to let the Bedouin's family survive. So uh, in the old days, when old days is just fifty years ago, actually, when the falconers were still Bedouins in the desert, the falcon was essential to hunt the meat that the family could eat. And for this reason, falcons are not regarded as a sports tool here, like for example in the US. Falcons are regarded as a part of the family. They live with the family. They have their own place in the bedroom. <laughs> they live next. It brings to the you back food <laughs> while it's hungry. It yeah. literally brings you back food while it's hungry. That's it a bond that no other animal will do. My dog won't bring me a burger. My dog no, no. will eat the burger. That'd be awesome if you could. I'd be at your house a lot more. <laughs> it's not exact. You have to go there. But imagine a female falcon is able to hunt and kill a gazelle. I mean, that's what? huge. That's, that's yes. crazy. That's a massive. gazelle? Yes, yeah, that's, that's nuts. mind-blowing. Yes, absolutely. That's amazing. What's and the it, wingspan? Of up a to falcon. Point, up to 1.2 or 1.3 meters in the large falcons, the cheer falcons. So it's pretty big. Six uh, feet, probably. Now, yeah. something like that, exactly. Wow. And when they are flying, they are able to catch another bird, which weighs around, yeah, three to six times of their own body weight. They can hunt and kill it in the air and fly away with it. Just imagine you carry one term yeah. of your own body weight. I can't even do half, but it shows how strong and I'm powerful they are. But females, uh, female pythons, not the boys. Uh, the women are always stronger. That's true. <laughs> and I'm mad if I'm in the animal kingdom with wings and somebody <laughs> else with wings yeah. knocks me out of the sky. I'm pissed. You're just like, flying what? around. Everything's going all good. Why can't you get the people on the ground? Don't yeah. hit me. Like, <laughs> With you, dude. Like that's cannibalism, right? That's like a chicken eating a KFC. Jerk. <laughs> no, they KFC doesn't actually have chicken. <laughs> no, they are absolutely, absolutely stunning, absolutely amazing. But because, and that's where we come back to what you asked, they can also fly very fast. They have a speed of around 150 to 200, or even up to 250 miles per hour. This Jesus. makes them the largest Jesus. bird in the whole world. And then, of course, if they hunt, they are not able to see any obstacle that's between them and the prey. So you can have a tree in between. You can have <laughs> the owner in between, the own falcon in between, and they will hit. And we have places where a falcon comes to me for emergency, has I'm a broken sorry. leg or a broken wing because it hit the owner. And the owner ends up in the hospital and the falcon ends up, ends up with me. <laughs> they, get, they get hit like Fabio with a goose. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that would be the falcon I got, the one that just kept running into me all day. Like, <laughs> you wouldn't get that falcon. That falcon would just continually ram yeah. into you over yeah, just and walking out to yeah. go to work in the morning and then just nails me in the back. Like, come on, man. Like, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's really amazing. It's really amazing what falcons can do. <laughs> I almost uh, died at when the first time I visited him, there was a, what is a sandhill crane, like in the <laughs> road, like three feet tall and just walking, came around the corner and just almost hit it. And I didn't, of course, I didn't want to hit it. So I swerve and I'm like, oh, <laughs> those things don't even fly. We have a ton of them around here. They're protected and they're like yes. three to four feet tall. They, they mate for life. And when an animal, there's, there's a human bond that takes place when Humans find out that an animal will mate for life. They go ape shit to protect that animal. They love that animal. They have a bond with it. They need it. It's yes. so weird. But there is some kind of psychological thing that says that needs to be protected. Penguins. Yes, <laughs> swans. All yeah. kinds of animals. Even falcons are also mating for life. But that's the ultimate dream of everybody. To find a partner for life. And I think that's the reason why we project our own dreams on the animals. And they are able to mm. fulfill it, which a lot of us are not able to do. Transference. So yes, exactly. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> that's absolutely true. Go ahead, Gary. There's a, a lot of, have you ever met any of the UFC fighters that have gone over there and done anything with the Falcons? I've seen like Khabib and some of the other famous UFC fighters in Abu Dhabi have had you no know, videos with the Falcons. Have you ever ran into any of them? No, no, unfortunately not. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, because we we have fights there a lot in Abu Dhabi, and then I always see videos with the guys with the big falcon on their arm taking photos, yeah. you know, and stuff. Yes, but uh, cool. I mean, falcons are special because they are the only animals in the world that are allowed to put a passenger cabin of our Arab airplanes without a transport box. They travel like you and me as a passenger, and it can happen to you when you're, for example, here in Abu Dhabi airport or a Dubai airport, that a falcon that comes, has the falcon on his arm, goes into the planes and next it. to you, and the falcon just has the hood on, and they just tie them with these little chesses, and that's how they go. Because they are the children of the Bedouins. It's not a bird here. They are not considered as birds here. They are so much more. They'd have to be. I mean, that bond is also something yes. that's generational. Yes. It's the same thing that happened with canines. We've spent so much time with them, relied on them for so long that yes. we have literal endorphin releases when we touch each other. I can't imagine right. it's any different with a hawk after generations of spending time with bloodlines, I would imagine. There's family lines that probably yes. keep the same falcons and yes. breed them over and over again. So DNA has memory. I don't <laughs> care what anybody says. It knows your past lives are your past relatives, your lineage. And yes. I, I feel like that that's got to be a bond that's like no other. That bond is amazing. And a lot of people say the falcon likes the falconer because he's feeding it. But that's not the case because you have this mutual relationship. And we did a test one time because here, you know, the man wore this white dress, this traditional white dress called Kandora. So we wanted to know if the falcon really knows the owner or maybe they just know the dress and they just focus on that. So we took a falcon, we brought some different people in. One was the owner and the falcon could recognize the owner. So it has nothing to do with just feeding or something like that. It's such a strong bond. It is a mutual love. And for example, when a falcon has an emergency and they come to me two o'clock at night and uh, <laughs> they need a surgery, the falcon will wait in the waiting room even three or four hours and they might be crying because they are emotionally so much stressed out because the falcon had the accident. So they wait until the falcon wakes up again. And it shows how strong this emotional bond is. And what you said before, this endorphin release, it is amazing. And that's scientifically proven that when you pet an animal, it can be a dog or a cat or even a falcon, even just for three to five minutes, you have a release of endorphins, of dopamine, of oxytocin, which are your happy hormones, your love hormones, your well-being hormones. So this means that the animal, no matter which one, helps you even to get in a better hormonal state and creates this happiness, this well-being, this loving feeling. And this also helps our mental state because this is what keeps our sanity. This is what keeps our happiness and this is what keeps us healthy. You could describe this as almost like an energetic scenario where human beings operate at a lower frequency and animals operate at a higher frequency, meaning they have less of the mental illness. They live more in the now. And that when we spend time with those animals and we're placing our hands on them and looking at them, we're actually taking on the now. We're becoming mindful and we're sharing that moment with the animal. We just don't realize what's happening. Yes, totally agree with you because this is what makes the change. And for example, if we look at horses, horses are mm. flight animals. They are very hypervigilant. But a horse can sense your energetic state. It can sense what's going on with you, even if it's still meters away from you. It senses this because it has this sensory yeah, feeling where it can get your energy. And for example, if you have people who have experienced very severe trauma or anxiety, and they are not even able to talk about it, either with a counselor or with a psychiatrist or with a coach, once they approach a horse, this horse is able to sense where the pain and where the hurt is. So the horse will go to the person and, for example, it will put his head on the heart or on the tummy or wherever, where it can feel where all this pain is located. And those people who are not able to talk to anybody about their experiences, they are able to open up to the horse. So they start talking to that horse because this horse becomes a kind of yeah, confident, con a kind of a way how they can project these inner feelings, even their fear, their traumatic experiences on, and they're able to start communicating and to opening up. And that's what animals can do for us. It is simply amazing. And once we understand more, and that's why I've written my, my, my award-winning book about pets, your pet, your pill, 101 inspirational stories about pets lead you to a happy, healthy, and successful life. Once we understand a pet is not just 
a dog to go out for a walk or a cat to play mm. with or a bird to sing with or a horse to ride it, <laughs> that there's so much more that they can help us to heal and to access these inner feelings that we have, the fear, and we can start processing it. And they can help us to heal mentally and physically. Then we really can get so much more benefit out of those animals. We don't deserve any more than that. Absolutely. We don't deserve much more than that. We deserve yes. an animal at a time because we've proven that we're not yes. capable of interacting with the animal kingdom. It's not that animals are something that we're above. In fact, it's kind of vice versa. Animals don't come to us. They'll go to each other. They'll hang out in groups of different species, but they don't come near the batshit crazy human that keeps trying to like poke it, prod it, eat it, scream ride at it. it, you know, <laughs> ride it. Yeah. Like, Take it down and tie it they up. They don't all want weird. anything to do with us. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah. yeah, it's sad that how how we misunderstand animals, actually, and how cruel many people are with animals, actually. And this is certainly something that has to change because animals can mm. do so much for us, so much more than we can ever imagine. And they can change our lives to the better. And we just need to let them do it. They need, we just need to let them help us and to look at them from a different point of view. Like violence and stuff goes way down in prisons when they've introduced cats and different animals yes. into the prison. Like it's yes. cut in half like immediately. Yes. Yes, yeah. exactly. And even if you have people who are suffering from Alzheimer's, for example, or, or Parkinson's or a kind of dementia, even they did studies, even when they just see crickets. And I mean, we talk about insects. Already their cognitive function improves and they start calming down when they look at a fish tank Imagine and just that. see the fish swimming in it. They start to relax. They are not um, pouncing around anymore. They start to settle down, to sit down, to watch them. So the impact they have is just amazing. As you say, it's relaxing us. It brings us peace. It brings us this serenity. Just we let it happen. We need to let it happen. We got to be grateful for the animals that allow us to do it. Actually true. And animals also can sense the state we are in. I mean, for example, mm. I, I remember um, I mean, my mother suffered from schizophrenia and we had a big dog, a huge, big 80 pound. <laughs> and I, I have a bull dog, mastiff, so I, I we have a big dog too. Yes, exactly. Then you know what I'm talking about. Now, this dog always went to her when she was about to drift in her other world. So the dog mm. put her paw on her knee to try to motivate her to take her for a walk. So my mother was just about to trip away. So this dog was not letting go. So she kept on doing, doing, doing until my mother somehow came back, stood up, took her for a walk and came back to reality. So she really credits our dog for helping her to overcome those kind of, of, of schizophrenic episodes. And this shows how sensitive dogs are because this dog didn't know what's happening, but it could sense the situation my mother was in. And this happens to other people as well. So that's so amazing when we look at it. And this is nothing about training a dog or giving a command. The dog mm -mm. does it on its own because they can sense the situation and they try to help you to get you out of it. I think it senses all of our mental illness. And yes. mental illness is the moment that we're left from the now. The moment yes. that we start looking somewhere that doesn't exist that's the moment that animals start to intervene. What you're describing yes. to me is when you become involved with that cyclone within the head, that's the yes. moment that an animal will reach out and yes. put it. My dog, my dog will actually make an audible, like small wolf at me. If I'm standing oh. somewhere and not doing anything and just thinking, she'll do that to break my attention. Wow. It's super weird. Yes, yeah. but because she can sense it. She can sense the change in you. And this can be a kind of, yeah, a kind of energetic change, even a kind of chemical change, but they can sense it. And she tries to bring you back to the present moment and to bring you back into reality and to get you out of that. And they have the ability to do that. And that's the fantastic thing. Once you hear her making this kind of woof and sound, you come back and you're out of the situation. And like this, she saves you again and again and again. You got to wonder if it's a preventative situation for them that it's harder to get their human because I, I think it's vice versa. They own us. We don't own them. And I, do you maybe think that they're trying to stop a larger energetic shift within their environment by keeping the human from going batshit crazy? And causing like a long-term, you know, 24-hour mood or long-term situation that the dog has to deal with because they're much more susceptible, like you said, yes. to our energy. They yes. feel us when we're not balanced. That's why 
crazy dogs belong to crazy owners. You know, that's just how it works. If you've got a neurotic owner, you've got a neurotic dog. Like it just, it's how it works. <laughs> so maybe they're trying to just control their environment and keep us in check. They definitely try to keep us in check, yeah, <laughs> because it benefits them as well. But yes, <laughs> certainly might also contribute to it. <laughs> I'm giving my dog a lot of credit because she's always looking at me like I've lost my mind. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> Her dog. Very perceptive. Probably when yes. you start talking about cyclones and uh, snow globes, like, what are you talking about? No one understands what you're talking about. She yeah. does. She looks at me. <laughs> it's like how they, uh, on, they get man. sense earthquakes and, and hurricanes and all kinds of yes. danger like ahead of exactly. time. Exactly. Yes. They can smell cancer. They can yes. smell diabetic yes. changes in yes. insulin scenarios. Yes. That's insane. Exactly. Yeah, that's nuts. exactly. They can even smell COVID. So <laughs> they can even smell patients with COVID. They had been trained always on COVID patients. Up. But it shows how advanced they are, actually. Yeah. We always believe we are the crown of, of everything in this life. But when you look at animals, actually, and they, honestly, but I think they're much more advanced than we are. We're crazy just building shit in place while they sit there and look at the heaven they're already sitting in. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we're messing up everything. And they're like, we just need some grass. Like, that, we're good. Just give us some grass. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. Yeah. Just go back to the basics and uh, yeah. enjoy the simple life, actually. That's the best for everyone. It's almost yep. ironic that we don't recognize it for the mental illness that it is, you know, and it's also super prideful to believe that we're above all of the other creatures doing the exact yes. opposite of us. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Didn't we learn on Sesame Street, one of these kids is not like the other? Like, yeah, it was, was pretty basic. It was like, this one's doing <laughs> this, this one's doing this. Ah, here's the fourth <laughs> one, human being a jackass. <laughs> like, it's pretty plain to see. <laughs> yeah, uh, go yeah. ahead man. i would just love to like get inside an animal's head like what are they thinking when we're just doing this jackass stuff constantly like, are they sitting there judging us like or especially <laughs> cats cats are always judging everybody they just sit there and just <laughs> judging i'd say cats Dog. don't count yeah <laughs> <laughs> I think they suddenly are wondering sometimes what we are really doing. And they are thinking, no. you know, you guys, you are crazy. What stupid things yeah. are you doing? Cats will eat your soft parts <laughs> as soon as you die. I don't care what love affair you've had with that cat for the last 12 years. The moment you croak, it's going to be eating your eyeballs and cheeks within seconds. It's really? not going to care. You are now lunch. <laughs> like, <laughs> that love is gone. <laughs> That's so weird. Dog will lay there, mourn, whine, howl, yes. won't do anything. Cat. You are next on the menu. <laughs> Dogs are different than cats, definitely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's true. Cats are very independent and <laughs> they love you for the food. But the dogs, they love you for yourself. That's the beauty of it. <laughs> yeah. I, I had a gentleman tell me a joke one time and I'm going to butcher it, but um, I was in the barber shop and he said, if you put your wife and your dog in the trunk of your car and came back, 10 minutes later and opened it, which one would be happy to see? <laughs> the dog. The dog. The dog. Yeah. Every time. <laughs> the, the wife will be angry, but there's a lot of profoundness to this statement yes. because the dog simply knows it's not in the trunk anymore, does not care. It's still now. Wife literally could hold it until the end of time as the thing that broke them down to the point of death, that they will never even see light again, won't get in a car, won't, you can't say the word Buick near them, you yeah. can't do, like, all sorts of confundled shit, but in reality, they were just in a trunk for 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, society would judge you worse, too, like, that guy put his dog in a trunk. Oh, the wife, yeah, I understand. She was probably giving him a hard time. The dog, like, wow, I hate, that, I hate that guy forever. The wife, like, yeah, I did it. Did that dog mate for life? Even more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. the beauty. Like, so if you want to have a great partner, get a dog, you know? <laughs> this will be the partner for life. <laughs> I'm not going to give you any crap ever. They, they might get a little excited and chew up your couch one day, but that's about as bad as it's going to get. They're always happy to see you. There's, yeah. there's, yes. the forgiveness doesn't even have to exist. It's yes. not even a factor. Yes. And even they know when you are coming home, like when I'm traveling, for example, even yes. they don't know when I come, but my dog sits at the door from the morning I'm traveling. I'm reaching in the night 
And mm. he will sit there the whole day, not eating, not drinking, not going out for a walk, just waiting, 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 because he knows I'm coming on that day. And that's spectacular because how he knows the date of my flight and the time of my flight. But they know it. They have this connection. Yeah. I saw it's a amazing. study on that where they were, they took like a certain amount of people, a certain amount of dog owners, and they sent them out of the home and they monitored the animals. And what they found was the moment that the person made the cognitive decision to return home, the dog's demeanor changed and yeah. it started to monitor the entrance for the owner's return. It's crazy. It's so effing weird. Like, yes. I love it, but it's it just shows it. Yeah. We have no clue yeah. how much we're capable of. Yes. If we're the most intelligent creature on the planet, imagine the moment that we harnessed mindfulness and started kicking ass. We would be unstoppable if they can feel us from fucking light years away yes. just because we decided to go home. Imagine what we're capable of. Exactly. Yeah, we would use that for evil. Mm. Like humans. We would use that for like weaponize it where the dog just wants to see you when you get home. That's it. Good thing. Yeah. Yes. The dog's just happy. And it's just how beautiful it is for us, actually, to have somebody who knows that we are coming home, who waits for us, and who has this instinctive connection, this connection that is so strong. It's such a strong bond that we cannot, we cannot even imagine it. We will not have it with other people even. I mean, how, how your, your wife or anybody will know when you're coming home. So this is such a strong bond. And it shows really how the mind of dogs is really different, how how, you know, how, how their kind of energetic field works in a completely different way, their sensories. It's just out of this world. And once we start to understand it, then we appreciate them so much more. And, and th then we really know what value they have for us. Absolutely. I think that's like the best place to draw this to a conclusion because everybody loves hearing about the bond between humans and animals. And I think if the one thing they should take away from this is that we need to cherish them, spend time with them, and recognize that they're a key to mindfulness that we're not utilizing correctly. I yes. think that it's so fantastic that you advocate not just for a specific animal, but all animals, that they can be healers for all of us out there, whether it be a falcon or a guinea pig you're going to get a bond with that animal because that animal doesn't think about the past or the future. It's 100% dedicated to you. Yes. And it loves you as you are without any kind of, of layers. It just loves the pure, real you. You don't have to pretend anything. You don't have to put on a show. You don't have to put on anything. It just loves you as you really are. And this is so, so liberating for us as well. You, you don't have to pretend something to somebody. You can just be yourself. Authenticity. And that, yes, that's it. This authentic you. And that's what you can be. And that's so beautiful, actually. And that's what we should really cherish and, and appreciate so much more because it gives us this feeling, this this peace and this this authentic you. And and that's marvelous. We need to learn to love like a dog. Oh, if we could do love this, like the a dog. world would change, believe me. It would, man. <laughs> it I'm going to get a t-shirt that says love like a dog. <laughs> Yes. Nobody loves you as truthful and as unconditional as a dog. <laughs> I think that's a great place to end. Dr. Margaret, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I could listen to you for days because you're such a wealth of information and you have such a great energy. You're super happy. I can tell you love what you're doing, which means a lot. That shows that if you're authentic and you pursue your passions, you will have a happy life or at least one that feels fulfilling. Thank you so much. Yes, I think that's the key for everything to, yeah, to live the passion and to live a happy life. And that's what we should all strive for. And thank you so much for inviting me. I, I really enjoyed this podcast so much. You are really great guys. And it was just a lovely podcast. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. So thank happy. You very much. Gary, you got anything you want to ask before we wrap up? No, I'd just like you to come back on sometime. And uh, we have so many different things you're doing that I think we just scratched the surface. So I think, you, you know, anytime you want, come back and we'll have a, a lot more questions and we'll figure out the snow globe thing. Did you bring a falcon on? <laughs> <laughs> I want a falcon in a snow globe. Yeah. But wow, that's seriously. a cool idea. <laughs> love I, I'd love to, to see that. <laughs> no, I'd, I'd love, love to, to come back because I think the audience can really benefit a lot from these kind of different topics. And that's what we all try to do to, to create better lives for everybody and happy that's, lives. That's what we're here for. So next time we need to do a live session, get your laptop or your phone, bring it into the, uh, into the clinic 
so we can see a falcon. Wow. Okay, we'll do that. <laughs> that yes. would be super cool. I would Promise. love to see. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's badass. Yeah, they're so cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And remember, everybody, be cool and keep learning. What's up, academics? This is Jay. I'm here to talk to you about Into the AM. This is a clothing and apparel company that I came across last year that has the absolute coolest designs. And the reason why I was attracted to it is because I grew up without a lot of money, like many others, and had to shop on that outlet rack with the irregular items. Things like the fly was over four inches to the left, or the right sleeve would be twice the size of the left. It looked like I was growing horizontally. Like, it's okay, honey, you'll grow into your left arm. So you really don't get a chance to express yourself the way that you want to. You go into life, you start putting on suits, you start putting on uniforms, and you realize you'd never had a chance to truly express yourself. Enter into the AM, a team of artists and creators who share a common vision. They see clothing as a canvas to express what drives you. Since 2012, They've developed premium apparel that elevates self-expression and provides unparalleled comfort for wherever your passions take you. Into the AM's passion for change is the driving force behind their brand. They remain committed to creating products that inspire and promote self-expression by partnering with like-minded organizations focused on giving back to communities in need. Last year, they donated 1% of all revenue from their graphic tees collection to the Art of Elysium charity. The Art of Elysium is an artist organization built on the idea that through service, art becomes a catalyst for social change. For over 24 years, the Art of Elysium has paired volunteer artists with communities to support individuals in the midst of difficult emotional life changes. They currently offer 110 community programs per month, serving over 30,000 individuals per year. The only permanent thing in life is change. Supporting charities dedicated to helping those going through these changes, trials, and tribulations require a never-ending commitment. The onus is on us as creators to affect change through our true, authentic talents. And Into the AM is the model of how this is done. Their clothes are handcrafted with care. They have a team of skilled artisans that craft each garment with the highest quality fabrics and eco-friendly inks. Not to mention, these things don't shrink, they don't fade, and they fit as if they were designed supernaturally. I'm stopped every time I wear one of the graphic tees to find out where I got it. The colors attract attention from miles, and the art is nothing short of spectacular, with designs for everyone. One of my personal favorites, Twilight Maiden. Go take a look. Into the AM does all of this while putting their money where their mouth is. 30-day money-back guarantee, lightning-fast shipping, and hassle-free returns. The deals are endless. Graphic tee bundles, discount promo codes. Get over there. Check it out. I'm highlighting the tees. But I'd be remiss to not mention that if you want to walk around in the absolute most comfortable shorts, joggers, and basic tees, hit up into the AM. I even wear the basics to the gym. Head on over to the tragedyacademy.com, go to our sponsors tab, and follow the affiliate link to the Into the AM store. Help support Into the AM and the Tragedy Academy by purchasing the absolute best apparel and the best designs ever. And remember, academics, be cool and keep learning.